Okay, next session we will uh, use in English, and uh, uh, next session speaker is Yu Fan. He is coming from Google. He is a developer advocate in Google, and uh, today he will share us using Lucy to visualize new network. And uh, he is also on YouTube, so you can also follow his YouTube, AI Adventures. You can Google AI Adventures and follow his YouTube. Let's give him a big hand, and uh, we will start this session. Okay, start. Great, um, thanks a lot. Hi everyone, my name is Yu Fang, and my clicker is currently not connecting to my laptop, so that's really nice. Today, we're gonna talk a little bit about visualizing neural networks and how to use that information to help us understand the predictions that they're making and the exact or roughly the path that it is taking, specifically with regard to image um, images. And we're gonna use a tool, an open source tool called Lucid that's uh, created by the Google Brain and TensorFlow teams. So one of the questions that comes up whenever I talk about this sort of thing is why, why do we care about what the inside of a convolutional neural net looks like? Isn't it good enough that if I show a picture of a dog and a, the, at the end the label says, hey, it's a dog, then we're done here, right? I showed a picture of a tree and it says, this is an oak tree, fabulous. But understanding why a prediction happens is just as important as what that prediction is. For example, there's uh, many real world use cases wherein if you get a certain prediction and it's right or wrong, but you actually wanna know the reason or the uh, underlying kind of constituent parts that led to that conclusion. And this is particularly difficult for us to do for image uh, situations. We have some intuition around text models. There's certain ways to kind of visualize that. And there's ways to understand for kind of less uh, complicated uh, machine learning modeling systems uh, like your decision trees and things like that. But for neural networks, the inside is still largely opaque. So today we'll talk through kind of three um, stages leading to this uh, new tool called Activation Atlases, which brings kind of new insight into what is happening on the inside of a neural network when an image is passed in. So we are relatively short on time, so I'll try to move uh, fairly quickly. Uh, first, just a little bit of background to set the stage, get everyone on the same page around some terminology and uh, rationale behind things. So convolutional neural nets, or from here on I'll probably just refer to them as CNNs, and these are typically, especially at the state of the art, relatively large models, and there are many, many, many layers. So in neural networks you have lots of layers, and specifically deep learning is thought of as hierarchical or representation learning. So at each stage of these models, uh, of this model, these are many layers, and different layers capture the meaning of the image at kind of different phases. And so I'll show you exactly what I mean, but intuitively you can think of it as the earlier layers closer to the input correspond to lower level details, things like edges and simple shapes, colors, lines, things like that. Whereas as you get further along, you get into more complicated abstractions and higher level ideas. Within a certain layer, you can think of uh, the structure, so I'm zooming in here on, let's say, like one of these blue boxes, right? The individual neurons, as you, so to speak, are made up of, or can be split up, either spatially, based on, so you, so you can see I took the image, and if you, this is lay on its side down below, we can look at it just saying, in that patch of an image, what is being activated? So this is kind of thinking about what neurons are excited or what neurons are responding to an image along these, in this example, 512 different channels or units. Or we can split it via channel this way and think about what is being activated within a certain channel. And so this will come into play as we actually uh, leverage the tools to visualize all this. And furthermore, and we'll see this image again, is this notion of here's the individual neuron, 
right? And a whole channel, so if we go back, this is a whole channel. These individual cubes are individual neurons. We can think of it as then those coming together to form an entire layer, and then all those layers get put into a row like this, and then at the end, we have a logits and a softmax function, uh, similar to just your general uh, deep neural network, wherein you have kind of um, the, the scores and then using a softmax function yielding a probability distribution for the predictions. For the rest of this talk, we'll use um, Inception v1 or GoogleNet as the structure that we'll kind of uh, peer into. Now, of course, this is something that came ba out back in 2014. The reason we're using this network instead of something that's more recent is that it has some particularly nice uh, visually kind of appealing representations that map very directly, um, for the human eye at least, from the inner layers to the output classifier uh, prediction classes. Uh, furthermore, these uh, labels 3A, 3B, 4A, are, we'll actually see them written out, especially in the code, as mixed 3A or mixed 3B uh, oftentimes. So don't let that confuse you. Okay, so the final thing is that within, uh, for images within explainability, there's two large divisions of considerations. One called feature visualization, understanding the uh, internals of a network and what it is that excites a particular aspect of the network. So that might be a certain neuron, it might be a certain channel or entire layer. And then on the other side, we can think about things like the spatial uh, attributions that we were looking at earlier where what parts of an image, like for example here, the dog face and the cat area, are more important to the outline, uh, to the final prediction that's created. So for the first part of the talk, we'll focus on feature visualization. So we'll have lots of crazy looking images like that one. Okay, so the first notion that we wanna think about is how do we create these uh, images? One approach, one of the first approaches was via optimizing the input. So what we're gonna do, imagine we take a trained neural network, right? we're gonna take that trained Inception V1 network and we're going to freeze the entire thing, right? It's done training, we're not doing any more training. And what we're gonna do is we're going to optimize the input image, the image that we're feeding it in, feeding into this trained network, and we're going to update that instead of updating the model. So we're used to updating the model for training, but instead we're gonna update the input image. And we're gonna start with static noise and iteratively update, because the model is differentiable, we can back propagate the activation of the thing we're interested in. That might be a neuron, that might be a channel, whatever it is, we optimize for uh, maximal activation of a certain aspect of the neural network in response to an input image. So we change the input image, try to get that activation to be maximal. And so over time, you can tell this image becomes more and more intense, uh, especially in the later stages. This process can lead to different outcomes depending on what we optimize for. So in the example we just saw, we were optimizing for a specific channel within a specific layer of the network. So you can also optimize for things like individual neurons leading to images like this, or you can optimize for, for instance, class logits, where you say, like, this is, looks like some kind of bird-like output, right? Um, in general, Optimizing for class probability, that final, final layer, tends not to give great results, and, and so has been largely uh, put aside. Okay, so for most of the rest of the talk, when we talk about activations, we are optimizing along the channel dimension. Uh, it kind of yields this uniform texture, as opposed to a zoomed in, whoops, a zoomed in texture, or this kind of composited texture of multiple channels. And furthermore, uh, one of the shortcomings, though, of this technique is that you don't have very good uh, diversity of examples. So you generate this example, right? I'm going to go back. You get this output for, let's say, one particular channel. But if you do it again, you'll basically get the same thing. And there's more to a uh, channel than just that one image. And so the way you can 
get, um, get something more out of it is to force diversity through giving it data set examples as the starting point. So instead of starting from static noise and optimizing to an end result, we can start with examples from the actual data set. So we feed it an image and we say, oh, this image gives it slightly positive examples, or these are maximum, uh, really, really quite high activation examples. And we optimize from there either more positively or more negatively. Intuitively, if you look at the two images on the left and the right, you can see that they are kind of uh, diametric opposites. On the one hand, we have a grid of kind of square, small shapes. On the other side, we have curly things with like stripes to them. And you can see the, the real world examples that correspond to that kind of pattern. Here's another example. On the left, we have kind of swirly uh, circles. And on the right, they're more straight edge, angular shapes. And so then what we can do, right, is combine the ideas of having these data sets and optimizing to give us better uh, results, or at least a more diverse set of results, than we would with just simple optimization alone. So you can see the simple optimization results on the left, and then a couple of different uh, possibilities uh, in the middle there. And I have a notebook that runs all this, but in the interest of time, I'll move on past, and then we can always come back and run some other examples and try other units if we'd like. Unfortunately, this also isn't a perfect solution either, because sometimes you end up with something like this, where within a uh, single case, the data set examples that activate this uh, neuron is uh, kind of different. Here we see cars, as well as a couple of different animal faces, all represented within this, this set of results. So you can see here, in the, especially in the diverse data set examples, you have kind of cat faces, you have, it looks like car bodies, and then whatever the third one is, the cat legs maybe. Um, you really have to get creative with these interpretations, so feel free to help me out <laughs> if I can't tell what it is trying to show me. So this leads us to the consideration that maybe looking at individual neurons or individual channels isn't quite the right uh, way to think about investigating this neural net, right? It is quite big, and it would take forever to, to look at all these things. How do we put it all together? It's not really at a human scale, a human comprehensible scale. So naturally, the next thought is to combine some neurons. In this case, uh, mostly two neurons at a time for now. Firstly is random combinations. So if we think of uh, each activation as um, I'm gonna, this is going to be like an aside uh, for, of linear algebra as basis vectors within the activation space, right? So in the higher dimensional space of activations, if those optimized lines are, in the, are basis vectors, so just like unit vectors in, on the x or y axis but with more dimensions, you can have linear combinations of these and you can choose to just have random ones in that state space. And so doing that gives you something that looks pretty good too, right? That seems to map to the example images that are in the image that data set as well. Uh, we can also do handcrafted combinations, just pick two and uh, combine them and you can yield kind of this kind of blended uh, result that is uh, jointly optimized together. So we say maximally um, excite kind of both these. And furthermore, you can interpolate between them because the, these um, activations can be kind of added you can basically weight the different amounts on each side and you can interpolate between various neurons. Okay, I mentioned that I was using Lucid to visualize all these. Uh, there's a ton of example code on Lucid, so if you're interested in this sort of stuff, uh, definitely check it out, take a look at Lucid. You'll be able to dig in far more deeply than I can cover in this uh, talk. Okay, so now we're gonna look at combining some of those basic techniques that we just first looked at into uh, trying to understand a little bit more about uh, the, the network's kind of decision-making process. And so firstly, what we can do is expand the idea of combining neurons further. Instead of combining two neurons, what happens if we combine all the neurons, so we're looking at spatial activations, we just combine all of the neurons in one kind of spot, right? So in this example, if we combine all the neurons in a given layer um, across all those channels, when you say, look at the snout of this puppy, you'll get all of these different activations. Some will be higher than others. 
And they're all adding up to the final result. But the one that overwhelmingly dominates, you know, you put that at the front and that kind of gives you an interesting indication of what it is that's giving the network um, the most response, what part of the network is responding to it. And so here we see the snout and then you can do this now for the entire image, right? If we can do it for one, we can do it for all of them. So this is what we call an activation grid. Intuitively, you can see that in the dog nose area that lots of dog nose-like things show up. Remember, these are not actual samples of this particular image. These are visualizations of the maximally activated inputs that maximally excite the, the network. So it, it's like a couple of layers of abstraction, which is, can make it a little bit kind of tricky to directly map to, but um, here we can see there's like the top of the dog's head. Over here, there's some cat-like shapes. How is this turning out on the slides? Pretty visible, yeah. Um, grass and things like that. And moreover, we can now look at other layers, right? Earlier, we were looking at one particular layer. And here we start in mix 3A, which is an earlier layer closer to the inputs. And as I mentioned, in the earlier layers, things are a little more abstract. So they, this, you, know, you can still kind of make out the shape of the puppy and the cat. And as you move on, right, this layer feeds into the next layer. And so a few layers later, few layers later um, the puppy has you know, more specific snouts represented, as does the cat having cat features, and so on and so forth until you get towards closer to the end of the network. Then what you can do is scale those images. So this is the same images, but with the, each image uh, changed in size based on the actual uh, size of that activation. So how excited is it? Because earlier all we did was we said, let's just display the sum of those activations. But those sums, some of those, some of those sums are higher than other sums. So we can show that you know, here we take going from here onto here and here we can see that the clustering of the activations carries through the entire network and we can see kind of where things are important. This is one way to build that saliency map of which parts of an image are contributing to that final prediction. And so to that point, we can then have something where you can see for a given patch of an image within a given layer what were the influencing neurons or what are the influencing portions of the image as it was shown to a previous layer, as well as what portions of a layer that particular piece is influencing. So here is you know, mixed 4A. It's being influenced by this region on a previous layer and it influences layers over here. And then later on in mixed 5A, you can see that these influences carry up, 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 up to the end here. Um, I just, put a few boxes here that it's not all perfect, right? There are situations where if you mouse over a specific spot, you can get interesting results like tennis ball or soccer ball because the whole network is, it's kind of, uh, it's not perfect, right? And moreover, things that are related, that are similar, are gonna be close together. So uh, it's only till the end that everything kind of falls in together and says, ah, this is a Labrador retriever and not, well, a tennis ball. And I also think maybe it's because in the sample, da in the training data, perhaps there was dogs with tennis balls in their mouth. It's always a possibility. Okay, so this brings us to the kind of big idea here, activation analysis. If we take the analogies that we've looked at so far as individual neurons being an activation just positive or ne negative, right? An activation of a neuron can only just, it's just a scalar number. So it's one dimensional basically. We can combine two neurons together and get basically a plane, a field of all sorts of different uh, interactions between two neurons. Those were the various ways we could combine them, either interpolating or um, random combinations, etc. And then thirdly, we saw the spatial activations. Now we're moving on to kind of trying to map out um, the overall activations of an entire input image in the space of that network, so to speak. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that again in, in, different, in a different way. The network itself, you can think of it as uh, having some kind of higher dimensional surface wherein each individual um, images, activations, each of these 
uh, sub boxes, all these little boxes correspond to points in that higher dimensional space. And so that's why there's lots of different dots here because you might have some dog dots over here and some cat dog dots over here. So all of these uh, individual small images map to different parts on this higher dimensional plane. And so the question is, how can we now represent the entire surface? How do we represent this entire space that the, uh, in this case, ImageNet or Inception V1 is uh, seeing kind of in general, not just of this specific picture of a dog and a cat, but how does it view the world as a whole? It's, uh, you can almost think of it as instead of trying to understand how does the network, how does you know, your eyes say understand a specific picture, uh, understanding how your brain processes images in the first place, right? It, this is really zooming out to the, 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 the whole idea. And so that's why there's dots across the entire space. So how do we do this? Constructing a uh, activation atlas. So the first step um, is to basically, well, so the idea here is you're essentially having this activation grid, but for lots and lots of images. In this case, this is constructed with literally uh, one million images. So you're running, the steps are one, we're gonna compute the activation grid for each of our one million images. Keep in mind that um, this image, once it, the activation grid is computed, each individual activation, we can think of them as separate values now. The fact that they were at one point coming from one image uh, is useful, but we'll come back to that later. The fact that, that these are in fact separate activations because the activation of the dog's nose versus the cat's ears, they should not probably be close together, right? Those are separate things. Just because they happen to be in the same picture uh, spatially doesn't matter so much. So then what we can do is we can take all of these activations, right? All these individual ones from lots of different pictures, pictures of seashores, pictures of fruit, pictures of vegetables, boats, buildings, roads, all sorts of stuff. And imagine we just, since these are all now broken up into little pieces, we just dump them all into a giant pile of space, right? But all these activations are multi-dimensional vectors. And so that means you can plot them. Right? So you can plot them in a higher dimensional space and then use some technique like a T-SNE or in this case a U-MAP, which is a uniform manifold approximation and projection, long words, but basically we're gonna project it to two dimensions because part of the goal at every step is to make it so that the data is human understandable and at a human scale. So now we have one million times the number of these little squares, uh, downscale to 2D, and then finally, we're gonna draw a grid over this very dense projection and average the activations within each grid because again, we want this to be at a human scale. And so now we end up with something that is much more comprehensible right? because all these dots don't mean anything. And then finally, we can, um, after we visualize this, resize these images, similar to the idea we saw earlier, we can resize the images based on the density of the number of activations within a certain grid. So some places there are more images, some places there are, or some places there are more activations, and other places there are fewer. Okay, so let's see what that looks like, if I can find the right page. Okay, so this is the, the activation activus, and we can uh, zoom in, we're in layer 4C, and so we can zoom in at, up here in this region. You can see examples of kind of snouts, right? And as we move down, you can see it blending into kind of the backs of animals. And then as we continue further down, we're in, entering kind of this region of uh, feet and legs. And then those feet and legs eventually, if I'm doing a good job of navigating, uh, will get us to kind of sand and feet, and then that sand will then kind of migrate into water and beach, right? And then let's see, some other interesting areas um, over here in this part of, and keep in mind, this is a 2D projection of a higher dimensional space. You can see there's things like signs, and uh, let's see, up here saw some things that are more kind of people-related faces, uh, and activities, and we can label these boxes, right, with their most common label that those activations came from to give us an idea of 
uh, where they're from. And then here there's some multicolored fruit. And just as a final reminder, we have lots of different layers and this is just one of them. So uh, let's go back. Okay, so I took a bunch of screenshots of everything I just talked about. So I'm gonna go through those. Oh yes, and one other thing you could do is you could essentially take a path through this space, right? So you can say go from one part of the fruit area to a different part, and you can see that in this contiguous interpolation, we can see here the fruit is zooming in, essentially, or here the sand is turning from water to rocks uh, and sand. Here leaves are going from focus to out of focus because in the data set there's lots of different examples. So now we can use this to understand a particular classification that happens, right? So here, let's say we have these two images that you might say are pretty different. One is a fireboat. Um, someone once asked me, what is a fireboat? It's like a fire truck, but in boat form. Uh, yeah, and then streetcars are, are, are this. And so when you look at the activation of fireboat and streetcar in the activation atlas, so here we can kind of, here's fireboat, Whoop. zoom out. So you can see we can um, basically turn off all the other activations and only have the ones that have fireboat. And again, depending on how bright they are, that's how the density of those activations within the square versus streetcar. It, for the most part, it's, kind of, it's pretty different. Um, but I wanted to zero in on a few specific areas because sure, you can say that oh, this has this and that, that's missing. But there's some interesting kind of um, features in those particular four places. Both fireboat and streetcar both have this kind of car-like windows um, activation. It also has this kind of crane-like activation. So the arms are where the, the struts are of a streetcar or of a fireboat. But what really separates these two, right, is that fireboats have water and streetcars have kind of houses or buildings in the background. We can also look at other activations. So one activation that is kind of fun to look at is uh, the great white shark. And in particular that you can see there's things like, you know, these look like fish. Right? And then there's also areas that look like water. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at mixed 5B for great white shark. So that's the last layer. So this is the layer before it starts really going out to the predictions and I can zoom in and we can see you know, these are the, it's very kind of semantically understandable. There's boats there and over here, there's some, some water. But what's interesting is down here, this is this activation, what's this? It's a baseball. What's a baseball doing with a great white shark? And so we might zoom in some more. It really does kind of look like a baseball. It's fair. Um, and you can kind of trace it back through other layers. You can say, what? well, where did the baseball come from? Oh, here it is. This is baseball. You know, what parts of the, the shark are coming from baseball? And here's, here's our baseball again, right? And it turns out that uh, because of this little piece of knowledge, we can uh, take a whale Right, because like a, take a fish, take a picture of a fish and uh, stick a baseball just into that picture and have the network believe you that it's a great white shark, like so. And it's not super easy to do, right? If you put too much baseball, then the image says, no, this is actually just the baseball, you can't trick me. But it's an interesting exam example of a high level adversarial attack on a neural network. Instead of tweaking the tiny pixel level details to fool a picture into thinking it's something else, here we can actually do it at a kind of semantic level. And so I took this idea and I looked around some more and I happened to find this region uh, of, of the mix 5 D or C level. And there's some airships, right? So I, I said, well, let me see if I can go find some pictures of airships. And at first I, I was tough, you know, this is a gray whale and it knows it's a gray whale. But with some fiddling, I moved the image around, I resized it a little bit. I got it to, to show up with great white shark and if you use a different blimp, you can get a different animal to show up. Um, so, so that's kind of, um, you know, my little exploration tale of activation atlases. I think there's a lot more to be found there. Um, we talked through kind of the basis of how to understand activation atlases today and, um, you know, hopefully give you some of the tools to explore further. And so these are some resources. The app that I'm using to, to show the whole activation atlas is, is here. I'm on Twitter at Yufang G. And um, we don't have time questions here, but you know, feel free to find me afterwards and uh, we'll chat. Thanks.
Okay, so because time time is up, uh, so the speaker will uh, stay here, and if you have any question, you can come to the front and ask the speaker directly. And uh, so, so we will go into the next session. What's the next session? No, so it's a uh, maybe a uh, uh, break. Uh, so maybe we have some question can because the delay. So <laughs> they have a, a question uh, from the anonymous audience. It seems the example of um, R for images is it possible to visualize structured data? Yeah. So this particular tool is built specifically for um, neural nets. You, I mean, convolutional neural nets. So you can load in your you know other convolutional neural networks. Of course, you have to tie it back to the data set itself if you want to do any sort of reverse mapping to the labeled images. Um, I feel like you could probably take, because this is all open source, take some of the ideas that are used here to build something for structured data, but because structured data is so different, depending on your specific data set, right? Like yeah. some structured data looks like this, others like, so you'd have to really customize it. So I, I imagine that it's possible. And, but it might be kind of a custom in-house job. Other questions? Okay, other, other question there. Oh, great. Uh, so the other question, um, is Lucy similar to Deep Dream, but uh, we can choose the best record? Yeah, so um, this is built, you know, this is basically continuation of the work that was done to make Deep Dream. And uh, you can basically explore the, uh, Specific neuron, which is updated by great. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, Deep Dream chose a specific layer. It, it optimized for um, the entire layer rather than individual channels. Lucid is kind of a more powerful tool that lets you uh, customize the whole thing a lot more, whereas Deep Dream was a little more specific. And so, yeah, you can choose a specific neuron, you can choose a specific channel, you can reproduce Deep Dream using Lucid. Um, but yeah. And, and then activation analysis is just like one thing that they built with Lucid. It seems these examples, oh, we talked about that. Uh, okay. Will Lucid be included in TensorBoard? And if you permutate, do permutations to the neurons to create a similar network, would you get a similar result? Perhaps this would be an exercise for the reader. <laughs> okay. If you, yeah, I don't know if Lucid will be added to TensorBoard. It's definitely like a separate open source project right now. So. I don't see that necessarily happening, keeping in mind that Lucid is not activation analysis, right? This is not Lucid. This is just an activation analysis. This is, there's some web code here and all that stuff. Lucid itself is a, a GitHub repository. It's a, a library you can pip install. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it looks yeah. more like that. Okay, I see. They cannot see you because uh, because the question dominates yes, the module. Right. Okay, so <laughs> if you have a more question, you can uh, send your question to speakers, maybe Twitter or email, and uh, you can also uh, go to his uh, YouTube channel and follow <laughs> his channel. Okay, let's thank speaker again. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.